Companies are united by a single shared trait. They profit from war and have a vested and necessary interest in the perpetuation of warfare. Across the board, their profits have increased exponentially since the onset of the Iraq War. Here we have a number of graphs for each of the companies, basically detailing um, their
1995, Dick Cheney leaves the Department of Defense and becomes the CEO of Halliburton with little previous business experience. In 2000, Dick Cheney becomes Vice President. He has a strong hand in advocating for the invasion of Iraq in 2003. In an NPR interview in 2005, an ex-staff member of Colin Powell cited Dick Cheney as having bypassed the rest of the government to control key issues regarding the invasion. Halliburton is awarded numerous no-bid contracts as the war in Iraq continues. These include numerous contracts to rebuild Iraq's oil infrastructure, the first of which was granted in March 2003 at the onset of the Iraq War. In 2003, the Congressional Research Service released a report detailing Vice President Dick Cheney's unexercised stock options and deferred salaries left over from his employment with Halliburton. The Office of Government Ethics confirmed Vice President Cheney's holdings as retained ties or linkages to one former employer, which you're not allowed to do. While Cheney denied having financial ties with the company, another investigation by Senator Frank Lautenberg in 2005 revealed that Cheney still holds 433,333 stock options worth over $9 million, which have been rising steadily in value since 2003. Just to recap, this is a person who, as a public official, initiated a study on increased military privatization in areas of conflict. He then went to work for the same private contractor used for the study, then having regained public office, and while still retaining a financial interest in that company, he helped start a war which now provides his formal employer with a massive new stream of revenue with no competition from other possible bidders. To stay invested in these companies is to approve of these types of relationships as means of improving these companies' profits. To share in their profits, to share the responsibility of these individuals' policy decisions. Dick Cheney is only one very visible example of a practice that is built into these companies' operations. Numerous reports by the Government Accountability Office have emerged over the years, citing the revolving door as a problem in the defense industry. In 2006, a report was released entitled Defense Contracting, Post-Government Employment of DOD Officials Needs Greater Transparency. I guess we lost that slide in the translation process. Um, this is a picture of the cover. Uh, more about the report. This report seeks to help enforce U.S. laws that, quote, seek in part to protect against conflicts of interest such as former DOD officials using their DOD contacts for the benefit of the contractor to the detriment of the government. It states that in 2006, 52 contractors employed 2,435 former DOD seniors and acquisition officials. The Government Accountability Office estimates that at least 422 former DOD officials could have worked on defense contracts related to their former agencies, and at least nine could have worked on the same contracts for which they had oversight responsibilities or decision-making authority while at the DOD. That was in 2006 alone. Mind you, that's a government document. Among the seven companies with the highest level of overlap in the document were Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, and Raytheon. The U.S. government itself has now cited this as a problem again and again. It is time for the university to recognize that these types of relationships are not a fluke that can be wished away, nor do they represent the actions of an occasional corrupt individual. They are, <coughs> rather, a fundamental part of these companies' operations. The argument may be made that these companies provide a valuable service to the United States by providing a so-called defense infrastructure to protect U.S. citizens. However, a substantial body of evidence clearly shows that these companies are not interested in the welfare of the American public. Their histories are filled with countless cases of overbilling and defrauding the U.S. government, showing again and again that their interest lies in profit maximization rather than protecting and serving the American people. <coughs> these companies have proved they are in fact highly inefficient in providing services to the United States Defense Department. They are driven completely by profit and have no incentive to efficiently allocate the tax dollars of the American people toward positive ends. These companies are united not only by the principle of exploiting warfare for profit, they also each have similar, similarly disturbing operational track records. These are not limited to defrauding the U.S. government. They include the manufacture of indiscriminate weapons, <coughs> the massive degradation of the U.S. and world environment, and a number of disturbing incidences specifically arising from the growing use of unaccountable private contractors assuming the responsibilities of the serious business of warfare. The next part of our presentation will detail the individual track records of these six companies.